In the beginning, there was only chaos, the primordial abyss. Then came Gaia, the Earth Goddess, and Eros, the force of love. There was darkness, and out of darkness came light. Then Gaia created the mountains and the sea. And then the earth gave birth to the starry heaven, Uranus, who created 12 terrible titans, the parents of the gods. Led by Zeus, the gods rose against the titans and declared war on him. The war raged across the world until Zeus finally prevailed, victorious over disorder. Ever since, this ancient world flourished under the divine shadow of Mount Olympus. This divine force acted upon every living thing. This was the Garden of the Gods. This is how life on Earth was created according to the ancient Greeks. Gods infused in nature were the way the Greeks made sense of their world. A whole dynasty of extraordinary characters residing on Mount Olympus, led by Zeus. Poseidon was the god of the violent sea, ruling over a secret underwater realm. In the gloomy subterranean depths was the twilight world of Hades, the god of the underworld. The goddess Demeter provided harvest and plenty. Her bounty fueled by Apollo, the god of light, who drove the sun through the sky. Many gods could transform themselves into animals, like Athena into an owl. The Greeks even had a special deity responsible for nature's rich diversity, Epimetheus. Zeus assigned him and his brother Prometheus the task of providing every animal with a special feature. But when they got to human beings, there were no special features left. So Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. This was sacrilege. Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining him to a rock. Every day an eagle would eat out his liver and every night his liver would regrow. Greek mythology is full of violent stories like this. That's because the Greeks lived in a violent place. Greece is a geological hotspot of volcanic activity and frequent earthquakes. Here, the European and African continental plates collide. These colossal tectonics created great mountains. Most of Greece consists of gigantic mountain ranges. However, most of them lay submerged under the blue waters of the Mediterranean. Their peaks form a galaxy of 10,000 Greek islands.
bays and rocky inlets penetrate deep into the mainland. Together with all the islands, they form a rugged coastline of more than 15,000 kilometers, a distance that would stretch from Athens to San Francisco. The Greeks believed that Poseidon's stormy character created this jagged coastline. He split the land with his trident and threw the pieces of rock all over the sea. Some of the islands look as if this ancient story might as well be true. The largest of the Greek islands is Crete. Poseidon chose to throw it right in the middle between Europe, Asia Minor and Africa. This island was destined to become a historic stepping stone between continents, for people as well as nature. From Crete, people sailed between ancient cities across the entire Mediterranean. Some mariners took with them native Cretan plants, which transformed far distant places. Palm trees from this tiny valley have spread all across North Africa, all because of its ancient human inhabitants who were so fond of traveling. Crete was home to the largest professional naval fleet of its time. Its mariners shipped crafts and arts all over the eastern Mediterranean, including palm trees from their own island. Who were these people? They were the Minoans, and they created the most advanced European civilization of the time. They built the gigantic Knossos Palace as a spiritual center of a huge city with 100,000 inhabitants. The Minoans revered and feared the Minotaur, half human and half bull. They celebrated its spirit in much of their art. But they weren't just great artists and architects. More than 4,000 years ago, when the rest of the continent was still deep in the Bronze Age, these people introduced money, the alphabet and irrigation systems to Europe. They invented central heating, water closets and paved streets. This is where Western civilization began. The Minoans only populated the coastal region of their big island. The ancient forest and the mountainous interior remained untouched, a place to spark the human imagination. This was a place of legend. In Greek mythology, the stroke of a titan's knife cut this gorge straight through the mysterious White Mountains. It's called the Samaria Gorge, and it was the scene of an extraordinary story. Zeus was born here because his mother wanted to hide him from his father, the cruel titan Kronos. Here, young Zeus was left to be brought up by wild goats, protected by the steep cliffs which these animals master with ease. For the Minoans, the wild goats became mythical creatures. Their agility in this extreme terrain 
and their ability to survive with scarce food supplies made them seem supernatural. Yet there are a few other remarkable animals that share this rocky habitat. Spiny mice roam the rubble, searching for a very unusual treat. In the dry summer, they specialize in finding snails which hibernate in a state of suspended animation. The mice can easily crack open the shell and devour the sleeping snails. Mice are not the only snail hunters in the mythic Samaria Gorge. Crabs hunt here too. They've abandoned their underwater home to search for tasty morsels. Sometimes a large claw can be as strong as a titan's hammer. Epimetheus chose well for the crab. To each animal, its own special quality. Small rivers run through these mountains, but in the heat of summer, they fall dry very quickly. Then it's time for the crabs to move. They have to climb the gorges and scale over rocky ridges to reach new waters in a neighboring valley. But this is where their struggle really begins. Male crabs are fiercely territorial. When two of them find themselves in the same stretch of river, then another battle of the titans is inevitable. There's a good reason for these duels. The rivers are very low in nutrients, so crabs need large territories to find enough food. When Zeus grew up, he returned to battle his titan father and liberate his brother and sister gods. Kronos had swallowed all those deities to prevent them usurping his power. But Zeus forced the cruel titan to set them free. And then he and his siblings went to battle against all the other titans, one generation pitted against another. In the end, the liberated gods defeated the titans and drove them deep into an abyss. After their victory, Zeus and his fellow gods lived atop Olympus the highest mountain in Greece. This place became the realm of the gods for a good reason. It has frequent violent changes in weather, and a peak shrouded in clouds adds to its mystique. The home of the gods 
is nearly 3,000 meters high. This creates a barrier to the humid air that rises up from the nearby sea. Here, unstable weather conditions can cause a sudden buildup of clouds, accompanied by frequent and severe thunderstorms. After all, Zeus was the god who ruled with the power of the lightning bolt. In ancient Greece, the places where lightning struck were considered sacred. Here, the Greeks built temples to worship their gods and divine the future. Oracles would tell mere mortals their fate by reading the flight of birds, by throwing bones, and by interpreting the entrails of sacrificed animals. Vultures also look for signals in nature by watching out for ravens at feeding sites. Ravens are highly cautious birds. So if they're already on the carcass, the vulture knows the coast is clear and won't be tempting fate by coming in. But these birds don't always show respect for each other. Ravens must wait until the vultures have had their fill. Or something else chases them off. Fresh meat is scarce on the barren slopes of Mount Olympus. As the top predator here, the wolf takes his claim. The ravens aren't bothered by the wolf. With the vultures out of the way, they can take second place at the banquet. Greece is a land of limestone. More than two thirds of it is made up of this water soluble rock. Water carved the Vikos Gorge and it's one of the most spectacular in Europe. 10 kilometers of twisted landscapes with rock towers that resemble bizarre statues. Natural erosion created these shapes, which have fired the human imagination. Here it's easy to see giant stone guards watching over sacred places. A river runs through the Vikos Gorge, quite possibly the legendary Styx, the mythological waterway separating the world of the living from the underworld of the dead. The souls of the dead had to cross the river of oblivion to reach the kingdom of Hades, the god of the underworld. Here, they would spend the rest of eternity in a labyrinth of dark secrets.
This is a gloomy world beneath the Garden of the Gods. Limestone frozen in time by the slow drip of water, creating dramatic stalactites. Here, the boundaries blur between water and stone, between light and darkness. Greece is riddled by more than 7,000 caves, totaling 24,000 kilometers of secret underworld. It's the greatest concentration of caves anywhere in Europe. Mysterious creatures thrive here. With massive front teeth, the lesser mole rat is superbly adapted to life in the underworld. It feeds on tubers and roots and spends its day tirelessly digging. To keep its mouth free of dirt, its lips are sealable behind its teeth. This bizarre animal has a superb sense of smell, which it uses to navigate through a network of burrows and tunnels. In fact, its sense of smell has completely replaced the need for eyesight, which is just as well, because this creature will never see the light of day. It's a prisoner of the underworld. According to myth, Hades also imprisoned his wife, Persephone, in the underworld's eternal darkness. Persephone's mother was Demeter, the goddess of fertility, who took a furious revenge for the loss of her child. She turned the world into a place of everlasting winter. Until her child was returned, she decided the Garden of the Gods would become entombed as well, in ice. Now Zeus had to act. He had to find a compromise with his brother Hades. They struck a deal. Persephone would be allowed to return to the world for eight months each year. And for that time, Demeter would call off her fertility strike. In this way, the seasons were created. As soon as Persephone returns above ground, the cold grip of winter is removed. Rivers run free again. And flowers carpet the land. Once again, the Garden of the Gods becomes a land of plenty. Greece is extremely rich in flowering plants. Several thousand species blossom here every year, filling every possible niche, natural or man-made. Its shores, too, attract visitors. Millions of birds stop over in the river deltas on their annual migration between northern Europe and Africa.
The Gulf of Amfrakikos is a meeting point for more than 280 species of birds. This is a vast area of river deltas, lagoons, salt marshes and reed beds. The brackish water is extremely rich in nutrients, providing a good meal of shrimps and algae. There's something for everyone, and the presence of cormorants means there's good fishing here too. Pelicans are not far behind, with huge mouths designed to capture great quantities of fish. Every bird has its own method of feeding. Although some birds, like flamingos, seem to prefer scrabbling to feeding. More peaceful is the black-winged stilt and the wood sandpiper. These birds prefer the solitary life. The whole of Greece is connected to the sea. In addition to the 10,000 islands, the mainland is also penetrated by countless lagoons, bays and channels. The gods must have known that water is the lifeblood of any garden. And in Greece, they provided plenty. In Greece, nothing is ever far from the ocean. And neither was ancient Greek thinking, because this was the realm of one of their most powerful gods. Poseidon, the temperamental god of the water world, whose unexpected mood changes inflicted harsh punishments on ancient mariners. And this is the most ancient mariner of them all, the loggerhead turtle. The Greeks learned to navigate the stormy seas as no one had done before. Still, Poseidon's temper sunk thousands of ships. The Greeks knew little of Poseidon's secret world. Perhaps that's why they only had one god for the whole variety of life underwater. The mysteries endure. No one yet knows where these long-traveling turtles spend most of their lives. But they never really lose their bond with the land. Every summer, they gather in shallow bays and warm lagoons to mate. Above the water, the seagulls are also reproducing, using the cliffs as nesting sites. The chicks enjoy safety and a spectacular view. These chicks are almost fully fledged, but they'll need to take care before their first flight. It's a long way down.
After mating, the female turtles remain in the shallow warm water for six to eight weeks while their eggs grow inside their bodies. The reptilian ancestors of sea turtles once lived on land, so this is where all newborn turtles must also begin their journey of life. One night in summer, the females secretly leave the water and bury their eggs in the sandy beaches. A few weeks later, the sand starts to move. The baby turtles head straight for the brightest spot, the glittering shoreline. There is a remarkable synchronicity to the hatching. Almost all the baby turtles dig their way out at exactly the same time. The sounds and vibrations of hatching encourages other turtles to leave their eggs too. There's safety in numbers. The turtles race for the shoreline. The seagulls have been waiting for this moment. As soon as they've been swallowed by the waves, the young turtles disappear without a trace, each in a different direction. It'll be decades before they return to the very same beach where they were born. Until then, they'll have to survive whatever Poseidon throws at them. Greek beaches are famous, but not particularly for boas. The sand boa is the only European cousin of those famous bone-crushing pythons and constrictors. The adult is only 40 centimeters long, but still a formidable hunter. It hides in the sand and waits to ambush its prey. No insects for this snake. It prefers to wait until something bigger comes along. This young African chameleon knows to stay away from the boa, and from her own kind too. Adult chameleons don't hesitate to eat fresh young ones. These chameleons are found on only one single beach in Greece. They're the only population outside of Africa. Their ancestors arrived as passengers on Greek ships thousands of years ago. In return for palm trees, Africa gave Greece these exotic reptiles.
Unfortunately, those ancient stowaways found one of the few Greek beaches that was similar to their own African home. Most of the Greek shoreline is not sandy beaches, but steep cliffs. Thermal updrafts and turbulence help the seagull chicks perfect their flying skills. Cliffs are also ideal for the horned viper. Here, it can absorb the sun's energy, readying itself for the day's hunt. Its prey are nimble and fast, but much easier to chase when the viper is warmed up. The viper has heat-sensing pits in the front of its head, so even when the shadows fall on Poseidon's realm, it can still stalk the mouse. This will be a long night for the mouse. The ancient Greeks built a temple to Poseidon on Cape Sunion. Here, the power of the sun joins forces with the power of the sea. <laughs> Who could not think this place was divine? Even at night, his temple is far from abandoned. Geckos need strong nerves when there are cat snakes around. They blend in perfectly with any stone surface. Like the gods, they can go unseen. Cat snakes are highly specialized gecko hunters. And still, they fall for the oldest gecko trick, to remain silent and still. Cat snakes don't have heat-sensing pits like the viper. Their prey is cold-blooded. They can only detect the geckos if they move. No animal could fool the best hunter in all of Greece, the giant Orion. One day, he asked the goddess Artemis to join him on a hunt in Crete. Gaia, the Earth Mother, was worried Orion would kill too many animals. So she sent a scorpion from the underworld to kill him. The scorpion approached the hunting giant and attacked him with the same ferocity it would need to kill a rival male.
It worked. The scorpion brought down the giant. However, Gaia felt remorse at the killing, but she couldn't undo the deed. So she named some of the stars Orion to honor the greatest hunter of them all. Greece is a land of contrasts and strange animals. This is the Mani, the hottest and driest place in Greece. Amidst the arid bushland lives this alien creature, the praying mantis. This is the male. The larger female is green. To attract mates, she releases a pheromone that acts like an irresistible perfume. The urge to mate dominates the male's behavior, but the female has a different and more powerful urge. Hunger. Normally, the female kills her partner after mating, but some males are only wanted for their body. A second male tries his luck and approaches. So far, so good. While she concentrates on feeding, he makes his move and mates with her. He must be quick. One false move and he too will lose his head. There's a good reason why the female eats her lovers. Having carried out his duty, the male is simply the easiest meal at hand. His sacrifice will help develop the eggs he has just fertilized. But still, it's always better to find another suitor to take his place. Cannibalism is common in nature. One can't read in a tarantula's expression whether it seeks a partner or a meal. Only when the two spiders meet do their real intentions become clear. And then it's too late, at least for one of them. Most of Greece should look like the barren Marni. But once more, the gods made some changes to their garden. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was at odds with Poseidon. So Zeus decided the victor should be the one who gave a present of everlasting value to humanity. Poseidon rammed his trident into a rock to open a spring, but it was salty. Athena, however, planted an olive tree. This became a source of fertility and wealth, and since then, the olive branch has become the symbol of peace, new life, and victory. Olive trees flourish throughout Greece and were naturally first cultivated widely by the Greeks. Olive groves are a unique forest habitat and the preferred home of many animals, like the little owl the symbol of Athena. In summer, the forest is filled with the strident songs of cicadas. It takes an expert eye to spot the perfectly camouflaged insects.
Cicadas are a main food source for another owl, the Scops owl. Cicadas need to be wary. Owls have fantastic eyesight. And can strike quickly. Even young owls learn to hunt these insects within their first six weeks. Athena could not have done better than her gift of the olive tree. For the Scops owl too, they are a present of everlasting value. The olive trees also help to prevent erosion on Greece's mountainous slopes. Without the roots to bind the soil, the land would soon be transformed into desert. Olive groves also bring people and animals together to share the abundance of nature. They're a favorite habitat of the margin tortoise. Here, there's plenty of food. And in this rocky landscape, there are numerous cavities for shade and shelter. But this is not the only human habitat tortoises have colonized. This is Olympia, where the ancient games took place. Here, tortoises live peacefully alongside each other, at least for most of the year. But during the first few weeks of the mating season, the males turn against each other, determined to win this year's contest for the fittest male. The victor will be the one who pushes his rival on his back. Victor deserves an olive wreath. The loser does manage to find his feet again. But he's lost his reputation, at least for this year. Nature and civilization have always been entwined in the garden of the gods. The ancient Greeks revered the power of nature. With myth, they made sense of it. And they infused it in their religion, their stories, their history. They created a vivid world of gods, titans and heroes. But 
all of this was inspired by the wonder and beauty of Greece's natural world. By its unique richness and variety. In nature, the Greeks discovered something divine. For this had already been a garden before the gods.